Now, where are you from originally? Indiana. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I was born in Chicago, and my parents on my second birthday moved to Indiana, and they oh, still live okay. in the same house there. Really? So, oh, I grew up awesome. with lots of snow, like what you guys had a few. So, few I went to school ago. in Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. Small, small world. It used to be the defense information school there. Wow. Then, uh, so I'll date myself, but that was like in '83, I think. But, I was uh, around, barely, but um, <laughs> we're not going to put that on the table. Uh, nothing from the. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I actually uh, I went back to Indiana like three or four times for events, yeah, and schools and stuff. So, and in Indiana is where. The Army told me I had a voice for newspaper, and don't, you're not going to be doing this broadcasting thing, so. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And the Marine Corps was actually trying to push more people uh, to do both sides yeah. of the house because we just had a huge shortage of broadcasters, mm. so. Anyway. Well, you went down the right path then, obviously. Uh, I've had an interesting career, but it's been good. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Equipping the Corps. In 2015, the Secretary of the Navy issued a memo to bring together the Department of the Navy Additive Manufacturing, or 3D Printing, communities to rapidly develop AM capabilities for integration into the fleet. The Marine Corps quickly began exploring additive manufacturing and formally established the Advanced Manufacturing Operations Cell in 2019. Engineers are a critical component to the success of our programs at CISCOM, and AMOC is a testament to that. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with someone who could probably claim they were experimenting with AM before it was cool. Chief Scientist for Advanced Manufacturing Operations Cell, Dr. Kristen Holsworth. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to a great conversation. But before I get started, Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you ended up here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I did my undergraduate work down at Tulane University studying mechanical engineering. And from there, came out here to San Diego, where I've been for nearly 20 years now, to do graduate work. And you got I, stuck with the weather here, right? No. That was one of the most uh, important okay. things I learned. Okay. Sorry. I learned a lot in you. grad work. <laughs> one of them was, yeah, absolutely, that the weather here in San Diego uh, okay. is, yeah, makes life a lot easier, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, I did my master's and Ph.D. just up the way here at the University of California, San Diego. Um, really enjoyed the work and stayed on there for my postdoc and became a research scientist wow, there. Fantastic. So worked on a lot of DOD-based research. Mm -hmm. So... Um, for O&R, worked on uh, helmet coatings to help prevent traumatic brain injuries. Wow. And after that, did some work um, supporting DARPA research, where okay. we were working on developing sonar stealth coatings for submarines. And That's that got to be exciting, all the latest cutting-edge technology they have access to. Just so. bleeding-edge technology yeah, yeah. and just some of the brightest minds, just a very diverse range of backgrounds and experiences coming together there. And so it was actually that, that um, research for DARPA that mm -hmm. was sort of my first foray into additive manufacturing. And so what we developed for this coating um, was a layered composite, and it ended up being, you know, in the order of like 10 centimeters mm. thick. So not... Something you typically think of as a quote unquote coding. Right. But then with the advent of additive manufacturing and sort of that unique design space that opened up, we were able to create that functional equivalent that was no kidding a coating that was wow. a centimeter thick. Wow. And then you just migrated. Now, now you're part of uh, NIWAC now. Absolutely. Uh, and let me make sure I get that right Naval Information Warfare Pacific. Warfare Center Pacific. Warfare Center Pacific. Thank you. Uh, what attracted you to the DOD research? I know your studies and whatnot. You had yep. some ties to that, but was it just that? There was that, one or? missing piece there, uh -oh. though. We did this very exciting research, again, bleeding-edge technology, but it never actually made it over to the warfighter who could uh -huh. benefit from it. And so, you know, adding to that knowledge base, well, that was really rewarding, 
you wanted to get it over to that warfighter. So it was actually a really natural transition for me to come over to what was Spay War at the time and now okay. now Niwak Pacific. Um, and it really provided me that opportunity to, to no kidding, take advantage of the unique space we have here in San Diego that's like such a fleet concentration mm -hmm. area. Gave you an opportunity to actually see the people who get their hands on the equipment and things that you've been... And not just see hands. them, but hear from them what they need. Because what I would create based on my constrained experiences, it would be very different what, from what a Marine would tell me he or she needs based on their experiences. Uh, it, it's interesting you say that because on a program that I was on before, I used to, you know, engineers are great. Uh, they develop great solutions, but sometimes they're not marine-proof solutions. So, Absolutely. Uh, it's great to get the marines, the scientists, and the engineers together to be able to develop some of that stuff. Absolutely. I know prior to working on AMOC, you were elected to be part of the Naval Innovation Advisory Council uh, for Advanced Manufacturing. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, and, really. Uh, what exactly that that entails? Exciting opportunity. So it was really a small cadre of kind of hand-selected Marines and sailors. Um, the intent was to help sort of accelerate and incubate innovative capabilities that support the Department of the Navy. So in particular at that time, um, was still tangentially supporting advanced manufacturing, but this time was really much more focused on the data aspect of that and securing data. So we studied blockchain and mm -hmm. actually um, supported a NATO exercise over in, in Poland there, okay. um, the Coalition Warfighter Interoperability Exercise, and used blockchain technology to securely share um, actually data files for one of our UAVs mm -hmm. with the Norwegians so oh, that okay. um, repair parts could be printed and utilized there. And the technology was so important because if I were to say, Manny, I'm going to send you this file and, and I need you to print it and, and install it, well, you want to ensure that what you're printing is actually what I intended for right, you to print right. because if an adversary... Something got lost in translation on the way over again. Yeah. Exactly. Something yeah. could get lost or, or corrupted or an adversary could come in and manipulate that file so that superficially it looked like you had the right component, but there could be some internal um, you know, structure that deviated that could lead to a catastrophic failure. So it was really um, an exciting exercise where we demonstrated the use of that technology with our NATO partners and actually flew those UAVs. That's awesome. Did you get, did you get to go, go overseas? I and sure spend, did. I sure uh, did. I spent three years at, uh, in Europe at an outstanding command there, so it's a great opportunity if you get to. You know, it's interesting Absolutely. you say that about transferring data. Uh, and I won't date myself, but I had an interest. Interesting, I was deployed and we had the first digital camera that the, the Marines would wow. share mm -hmm. and hand off. Uh, and we did a test of transmitting an image from yep. uh, a faraway place. And uh, every time that image got transmitted, you lost about 10% of the data. <laughs> So by the time I made it all the way back to headquarters, Marine Corps, it wasn't wasn't exactly what you intended like to send out. the worst version so, of telephone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it went from an eight by ten, not even to a three by five. So, uh, but needless to say, technology uh, has come a long way. Absolutely. So I know you were uh, part of NIWIC. Uh When did you make the transition to support the? The Marine Corps, you're still part of NIWIC, right? Absolutely. So can you explain that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, a really good question, and actually one I think that comes up a lot. And so NIWIC Pacific is an echelon three command. So mm -hmm. we're Navy Working Capital Fund, and as such, we support projects. Um, NIWIC Pacific in particular has a vision um, where they really pursue projects um, and encourage us to think big, to go fast, to think warfighter, and go tough. And so all of the work that we do within the Advanced Manufacturing Operations Cell directly aligns with the vision that's set forth at NIWIC Pacific. So I'm fortunate where I'm able to support the AMOC 100% mm -hmm. time. So Marine Corps Systems Command is my full-time sponsor. Okay. And, you know, being co-located out here at Naval Base Point Loma obviously allows the AMOC, which is headquartered over in Quantico, right. to have a much greater reach, especially um, up with the, the Marines up at one MEF here. Let's focus on the uh, AMOC uh, for a little bit. 
It's not this huge organization. <laughs> it's not. Although we play I personally big. We know play who big. they are, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a... Uh, first of all, I want to back up a second and say you talked about going fast and whatnot. Uh, and we just recently left the AFCA conference out west. I mean, hit the key message right there. Mm -hmm. How do we go faster in the things that we do? How do we get this technology and whatnot in the hands of, of Marines and sail sailors, soldiers, airmen? Uh, so that's a challenge that is brought to you on a daily basis. But anyway, changing tactics, getting back. <laughs> tell me about the SAMOC team. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that, that it's not a big team, because I know we've, we've been to um, some other facilities, visited some university partners, and been asked, oh, and how big is your team? And um, when uh, Captain Audet and I answer, seven? We get a, excuse me, what, 70. Oh, yeah. OK, that's a good size team. And we just kind of laugh and say, no, no. About seven yeah. at, at this time, but that's because... And that's big. It's been growing. It, it has be, been growing. <laughs> it used to be two or three, if I recall. Yeah, you're, uh, you're spot on. You're yeah. spot on. But, I mean, we're able to support one, two, three MEF. Um, and, you know, I think we just have such a great network of Marines and natural innovators in the Fleet Marine Force that although AMOC proper might be seven i think the network as a whole is is definitely orders of magnitude more i think one of the things i want to touch on just briefly is um amoc team runs kind of a a call center for lack of a better term uh maybe a help desk mm -hmm. for additive manufacturing can you touch on that just a little bit yeah the intent of that absolutely so within the marine corps order um, for additive manufacturing mm -hmm. so it's mco 4700.4 it mandates that we establish a 24-hour help desk and so most recently we've actually been working with the folks just up the way here at mctissa oh, okay. to standardize the development of that help desk so that just as they help all of our, our Marines globally with their needs, they'll similarly be providing that support for any of the advanced manufacturing needs that come forth to the AMOC. That's awesome because I know for the folks listening, and they're doing the math, there's a team of seven, <laughs> they got a man at 24 hour help desk, they're seven days a week, so uh, so it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. It is, I, and that's what McTissa uh, does so well, that's, yeah. I mean, a mandate they've supported for years and years and so effectively. And that's where Marines know to go for help, too. So I think it aligns really well. And, and the fact that, you know, you have somebody that talks the lingo on the other side of the line, you know, Absolutely. not just from the, you know, so you, you get a, a, a comfort level. Exactly. Say, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Uh, so, and, and I'm sure the team can say, oh, yeah, we've had this problem before. So, oh, yeah. Uh, well, and so we're also working with McTissa to develop the AMOX website. And just as you mentioned, you know, they've helped us put together our frequently asked questions because, perfect. like you said, most of the questions that our Marines have are not unique questions. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, using a common set of equipment and coming up with, you know, a lot of the, the same questions. So, yeah, McTissa has been really helpful on both fronts there. I think one of the things, so, um, you know, again, the Commandant talks a lot about speed, speed with everything we do, because otherwise we're going to get left behind. Absolutely. Uh, and I think what's great to listen to the stories that come out of AMOC, the stories that come out of the Marines that are out there uh, solving problems uh, on the expeditionary fronts, mm -hmm. way out there where, you know, they can't call FedEx or Amazon or anybody to, to bring them apart. Right. Uh, so I think it's fascinating how you all have developed uh, the relationships and the capabilities yeah. to be able to do some of these things and get it done. I do want to talk about another aspect mm -hmm. uh, in our industry partners yes. because, you, you know, we do a lot of our stuff, um, but a lot of the stuff that we're able to do is because somebody in industry is investing the money, mm -hmm. putting the effort forward, buying the technology, and get in and Can you share with us a little bit some of the things you've done over the last uh, year or so uh, as it relates to industry? Like you said, they are critical partners. And I mean, with their specialization, so many of them are at that bleeding edge in these various technology spaces. And, and so we've been very fortunate to work with industry in a multitude of ways. Um, we often pursue CRADAs, Cooperative Research and Development Agreements, that okay. allow us yep. to partner with industry or academia 
at no cost to us, which, as you know, that's that's our favorite price tag, right? Zero dollars. Taxpayers are loving that one, and hopefully our friends on Capitol Hill realize that, look, we're doing it's all It's an this incredibly <laughs> powerful capability that, yeah, Congress has authorized us to pursue. And so, you know, it not only helps us understand where industry is leading, but also helps industry understand, you know, what that marine actually needs and what their operating environment will be versus industry working in a bubble. And so we've had some fantastic industry partners over the past several years supporting advanced manufacturing. We've worked with HP mm -hmm. for actually about the past five years. Um, and again, that began as a cooperative research and development agreement as they were developing their metal jet printing capability. Um, so really advancing the breadth of materials that we could print. And that's actually a great point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but when people think about 3D printing, you, you know, and I'm thinking about the plastics, the polymers, these things, and I know we've mm -hmm. we've migrated to concrete 3D printing, uh, and now you're talking about uh, actual Metals. metal printing. So, uh, Good talk point. to us a little bit about the different areas you've. You've yeah, covered over the years. that's a really good point. Like you said, to mention up front that breadth of materials, mm -hmm. I think has dramatically expanded even since the establishment of the AMOC. As, as you mentioned, you know, it very much initially focused on various polymers right. and right. has very quickly expanded into metals, which obviously provides us with immense capability to directly replace components that we have on our OEM equipment. But beyond that, um, it's expanded even further into composites, which personally, from, from my background, I think is especially exciting because mm -hmm. composites were developed because they fill a space that right. monolithic materials never had the capability to do so. And, and as you pointed out, we've similarly expanded into concrete. You right. know, just, just a couple years ago up at Camp Pendleton, we printed a HIMAR shelter in 36 hours. Wow. <laughs> and and I say we. And Normally that it would take 36 hours just to do the paperwork to get something. Oh, we won't procured, talk about the paperwork but, on the front side of that one. But I mean, that was that was a team of eight Marines printing over 36 hours. And wow. that was spread over four days just for the comfort of right. the, the crew supporting that. But the printers can print around the clock. And, you know, that really helps support our needs and, and meeting the missions um, as, as we see them. Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, it's just, it, it really is the, the depth and breadth of the things that you've done. Now, I know you mentioned, uh, you mentioned industry. Uh, how about academia? I know we work with academia a little bit. We absolutely uh, do. And uh, again, you know, just as industry, you know, is very much at that leading edge of technology. I mean, even more so the research that's being done at some of the universities across the nation, I mean, will just um, blow your mind. And, and in fact, one of our, our key partners has been the University of Maine. Wow. And, and some of uh, the folks listening might be aware that the University of Maine has the world's largest 3D printer. Wow. And um, what we actually utilized that for just recently was printing the world's largest uh, vessel. So, wow, that's incredible. like you said, working with them, you know, those researchers at the universities in partnership with industry, mm -hmm. with requirements and needs and operating environment informed by our team and our Marines, I think really provide proves this incredibly robust partnering mm -hmm. scheme. I think the other thing, so if, if I'm a shipbuilder, I might get a little excited at first, but uh, you're really working hand in hand with industry. Absolutely. Uh, and not, it, we're not coming up with these creative and you know, far-fetched ideas anymore. We're walking the path with industry. Industry is evolving. Uh, and yep. if I'm correct, you're doing some great proof of concepts out here. That's exactly it. Like okay. you said, it's an incredibly powerful I want people to understand scheme. that the Marine Corps doesn't have a manufacturing facility that's spitting out connectors here. But Spot on. <laughs> we absolutely do not. And like okay. you said, we're working with industry and they're providing that naval architecture expertise, mm -hmm. working with universities that provide that sort of leading edge technology implementation. Um, but again, everything that we're developing is sort of in that realm of proof of concept and meant to augment right, our existing right. capabilities, not necessarily replace those, but supplement them with sort of, as we were hearing earlier um, at FCOS, providing some of those attributable capabilities yeah. that could be created 
very quickly because guess what? A 3D printer, it doesn't care what file you put right. into it. It's going to print what you need vice a factory floor that's going to need to be turned over, have the right presses, the right dies, the right equipment all pivoted over to that capability. That's a great analogy. It's an awesome analogy. So we've come a long ways, but let me take you back a little bit. What's been some of your challenges? What have you had to overcome? What's the team? I'm sure there's some hurdles in the road. To, Absolutely. You know, and so as you might imagine, some and you've probably heard exactly, you've probably heard this yourself where, oh no, 3D printer, you just get a file and you hit print and you go and <laughs> everything turns out perfectly and there's there's no additional work associated with that. And um, I know we all know the term of expectation management. And so when conversations like that arise and, and leadership thinks it's as simple as press, print, go, um, that requires some, some course correction and some, some additional walking back to make sure folks understand the realities associated with the technology. Um, that's not to say, you know, that one day we might not get to that place, but right. especially when we're working with industry and academic partners on developing technologies, right, that's, that's technology that's still in progress. Um, we're not at that point just yet for, for all of our 3D printing needs. Can you walk us a little bit towards the testing perspective of it? Because it's not just print something, here you go. Uh, this should take care of you. You need a new steering wheel, here you go. Uh, you have a test uh, process that you go through. We do, we do. And so we work really closely with the program offices associated with the respective parts or components that Marines might be bringing up. And so it's an interesting scenario because, as you might imagine, uh, the various systems that we have, we don't have a drawing for each part and a right. test for every part. We, we test systems, mm -hmm. right? You need to know whether that Humvee operates Correct. as a system Correct. as you need it to. So the program offices are really instrumental in providing that sort of systems level testing. And we work with the fleet directly in terms of doing some preliminary form fit function function testing and when all of those you know check out and and we have what seems to be a successful component that's when the program office takes that handoff and does the more extensive reliability and durability testing that's in line with what they're doing with their their vehicles day to day so Manny's no engineer and I'm not going to pretend to be one I pretend to be other things on occasion <laughs> but so I'm going to take it down a step uh, can you give us a couple examples? I know we've done like, you know, door handles mm -hmm. and things like that. I mean, give us an example or two of uh, uh, some of the things that the AMOC team has, yeah. has helped develop, test, and maybe put in the hands of the Marines. Yeah, well, so I would say, first of all, almost all of these use cases are always generated by the Fleet Marine Force, Good right? Good point. So, so it's, it's a Lance Corporal out there who had a bright idea and say... Absolutely, and a Lance Corporal who grew up in a digital world, yes, right? Yes. So this is all second nature to him or her. Um, but it's point. what we see time and time again is that the person closest to the problem is often going to be that person that comes up with a solution. Um, I know one of one of our most recent use cases that the AMOC supported um, coming out of Camp Pendleton here, uh, a Marine had an idea for an innovative tool uh, uh, to basically help them do their job better and ensure less damage. So mm -hmm. there's uh, a slide hammer that's utilized to remove a steering wheel from a vehicle. Oh, okay. um, and apparently Those that's, I'm familiar with. Those, yeah, exactly. <laughs> check, check. Yeah. Apparently the steering wheel needs to frequently be removed for, for most of the maintenance. But this, as the slide hammer might suggest by its yes, name. Yes, it does. <laughs> Can I get a bigger one? This one's not working. Well, very successful in removing the steering wheel, often breaks the steering wheel <laughs> in that removal process. And thereby, you could guess it, yes, deadlines the vehicle. <laughs> absolutely. No steering wheel, we're not moving anywhere. We're not anywhere. going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. So seeing this on repeat, one of the Marines had developed a new tool mm -hmm. um, to prevent that breakage so that he could routinely remove that steering wheel, keep it intact, 
perform the maintenance activities needed and reinstall. And, and to say that this is a success story, I think, is, is underrepresenting it because this is now a tool that has been distributed across the Marine Corps enterprise. And I think it has implications beyond that because we know our vehicles are very common with our sister services here. So to, to create a DOD level Absolutely. solution is, is what a lot of our Marines are out there doing. So actually that's a great segue because one of the things I want to talk about briefly, you work with some of the other labs, research facilities and whatnot. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that uh, you've done? Uh... Sure. So just as our, our various centers have, you know, a lot of breadth of capability, we're also aware that they have a lot of specialization. Mm -hmm. um, so in particular, you know, we work very closely with our colleagues over at Cardrock. Okay. Um, so they provide actually a lot Been of there a couple of times. hotter Spread dynamics facilities. support for our ship to shore yep. connector. Um, and similarly, we work across service because, um, as I just mentioned, you know, obviously a lot of our vehicles, you know, are common or at least slight variations to what the Army utilizes. So we work very closely with their ground vehicle system center as well so that we can avoid redundancy, leverage our capabilities together and, and really just try and help everybody get further faster. That's awesome. Fantastic. I, I got to ask you. Um, and. What's next for AMOC? And, you know, obviously we don't know where the budgets are. We don't know, you know, because we, mm -hmm. we, we do these proofs of concept. We do these things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we have to have a requirement mm -hmm. from somebody. Uh, and we have to have that very important funding piece mm -hmm. uh, to continue to support the yeah. Marines. What, what do you envision is next for, uh, for the team? So Besides getting things. bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not getting smaller. Okay. I would say several things. So I think it's really important to note, first of all, the Marine Corps has two programs of record okay. for AM. Um, and actually just began fielding the first one about three weeks ago or so. So our XFAB, um, the first one went out at Camp Lejeune. I know they did their new equipment training. And that's not only the first program of record for AM in the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. but it's the first program of record for AM across the DOD. That's awesome. So really, yeah, incredible. I, I definitely see We us are the 911 force. We get there first. So therefore it's Case only fitting in point. <laughs> only fitting exactly exactly oh, that's fantastic. but definitely to help bolster that equipment set capability our next big effort is focused on developing our digital manufacturing data vault okay. which DMDV is really just analogous to that robust digital infrastructure that will support all of the AM equipment that's being fielded um, as you could imagine you know having a 3D printer on an island on this pocket of capability, that pocket of capability, a or, powerful yeah. tool. But if we can network that capability, then we've really optimized how we're utilizing that. So, so actually developing our DMDV program of record is um, next in line for our capability there. Um, but similarly, as you mentioned early, earlier in our conversation, um, this technology is advancing so quickly. So we continue to work with industry and academic partners to evaluate that technology because our programs of record have built in these technology refreshes. So we want to make sure that we're taking in the latest and greatest and combining it with the Marine Corps' needs so that we're giving them exactly what they need where they need it. So. To say you're excited about what you're doing is probably an understatement in my part, but uh, and I think it does show. Uh, <laughs> but I have to ask you, what are you most proud of? What stands out in mind? Wow. Well, you know, I used to. I have tougher questions later, but I'm going <laughs> to deal with this one now. No, like you said, to, to, to say I enjoy my job is, yeah, understatement of, of the century here. I absolutely love what I do and, and think I'm like the luckiest person to be able to support this. And I've worked closely with um, Camp Pendleton for years and in particular um, First Marine Logistics Group. Mm -hmm. And um, several years ago, um, the commanding general I was supporting there uh, when we had some distinguished visitors coming, he introduced me as, you know, Dr. Holsworth, mm -hmm. honorary Marine. And I thought, <laughs> all right, I think I've accomplished accomplished my my intent here that they that's understand i'm here to that's, serve uh, them and not yeah. not yeah for ulterior motives so. no that's uh that's definitely something special so uh that's oh, not agree. something to take do. lightly yeah, absolutely not at all. so i gotta tell a little story first and then i'll ask you a quick question so uh 
I love this, by the way. So I've got three kids. I'm not going to get into it, but my youngest child is 20 years old. So needless to say, they're a little bit, we won't date ourselves. <laughs> but let's just say in the mid-2000s, maybe 2005 or six, my daughter, who's my oldest, comes home and says, Dad, I'm, I'm going to be going to this camp. And we're going to build these little robots and we're going to play with Legos and stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool, you know, and I'm going 100 miles an hour. And I'm like, oh, great. My daughter just joined some after school club. Mm -hmm. So things are great. Uh, let me fast forward a little bit because that started in her last year of middle school. Mm -hmm. And then she went to high school and then her brother four years later went to high school. Uh, and I got involved in this thing called robotics, mm -hmm. first robotics competition. And I do have to give a shout out to Team 339 Kilroy in Stafford, Virginia, uh, because I spent about 12 years <laughs> following them all around, going to all kinds of places. We had a phenomenal time. I yeah. mean, hundreds of competitions later, uh, state, mm -hmm. national, international, I went to St. Louis half a dozen times. Uh, I'm not a robotics guy. I don't build robots. Uh, I have invested a lot of money in Legos and things. So mm -hmm. I got to tell you, and to all the parents out there listening, if your kid comes home and says, I want to join a robotics thing, think about it. And I say that because I watched a lot of young kids grow. I watched my mm -hmm. own. Uh, all my kids are grown. They're doing their own thing. Uh, they're all phenomenal in their respective areas. My daughter did not go up to be an engineer. She had a passion for teaching, so oh. she became a very successful science teacher, so I'm extremely proud of that. Mm -hmm. All my kids. Uh, but I say that, and I'm a little partial to, you know, to the young girls who maybe aren't all involved in math and sciences, mm -hmm. and we, we continue to push them in that direction because it's always been this mysterious side. But I gotta ask you, you're a woman in STEM, You've been doing this. You have a passion. Your your excitement about this shows. Uh, what do you have to say to all the young ladies out there who, you know, the young gals listening, uh, who want to get involved in this world of engineering, this world of science? My uh, first that's thing really is changing do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, so I, that was know, support Just that do it. I so want to get a bumper sticker. <laughs> Um, absolutely. I mean, no, I've been fortunate advising. that I've had very um, thoughtful mentors along the mm -hmm. way. So um, in high school, my physics teacher in you know, my junior year had asked, well, Kristen, have you thought about what you want to be, what you want to do? <laughs> and as you probably can relate, being a junior in high school, the answer is no, I haven't really like given that a whole lot of thought, you know. Um, and he mentioned, well, you know, I'd really encourage you to do engineering, mechanical engineering. And I kind of laughed thinking, well, <laughs> that's what my father does. He's worked yeah. in the automotive industry for yeah, years. Yeah. So that absolutely makes sense. But, you know, listening to, to those around you who definitely have your best interests in mind, but have had the opportunity to work with you and observe you and, and help mm -hmm. guide you to definitely take advantage of that. Uh, I think that that absolutely goes a long way. And and I think similarly to not be afraid of, you know, it being perhaps, you know, a male dominated mm -hmm. um, field. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I, may, maybe it's because I grew up as like the middle child with an <laughs> older and younger brother. And I was the only girl on my father's side of the family. But it never really even registered to me that it oh this is a you know male dominated field and oh my classes you yeah. know don't seem to have too many f females in them but i think it's absolutely important to make sure we have more females going in there because just as we talked about earlier we're all constrained by our experiences mm -hmm. so adding to that layer of diversity i think is only going to give us more robust solutions and and hopefully as as your kids experience them i and ultimately i think it's it's people's work that speaks for itself. I, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, nobody would have somebody shun their ideas because, oh, what would and you I, know? And I got to tell you, I, I, I do, uh, I want to give credit where credit's due. She had great mentors mm -hmm. in, in high school as my, my boys did. Uh, but the Navy played a little part because mm -hmm. we got in, out there in Stafford, Virginia, uh, Dahlgren, mm -hmm. uh, the Navy lab out there. Uh, engineers volunteer to be mentors mm -hmm. and participated in all these events. So what began as a way for getting young minds to 
participate in these things really became a way of life. Exactly. Uh, and I think, uh, look, you're a shining example uh, of what you can do if you just keep chasing it. Uh, and I think the pendulum has swung quite a bit. Uh, there's so many bright and talented uh, young women out there, uh, such as yourself, doing doing a lot of great things for uh, for the future, not only of our service, but the future of this country. So, uh, well, I thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Absolutely. And I want to thank you for taking the time. I mean, I flew all the way out <laughs> west. Uh, oh, I chased you. I chased yes, you back here. I yes. flew out to you first. <laughs> Uh, but I, this has been extremely insightful for myself, and, and hopefully our, our folks uh, uh, appreciate uh, what you've had to share. Uh, because I think there's some, I know General Pasajan likes to say it a lot, these are exciting times for us. There's a lot of things going on. And what you just talked about is a perfect example of all those exciting things. Marines are getting involved mm -hmm. in the solutions to some of their problems for the future. So. So for that, uh, Dr. Holsworth, I thank you. Before I let you go, Kristen, we have a, another part of the show that we like to call the lightning round. So are you ready? These are some hard I'm ready. questions. Hit me, so, hit me. All right. <laughs> uh, and I know you've obviously traveled a little bit, but I do have to ask you, what's your favorite vacation spot? Well, in all that travel, Honestly, it's still the California coast, Is it San really? Francisco and sort of the, the juxtaposition of the concrete jungle <laughs> and going across the bridge to the towering redwoods is still some of my favorite. So I, I tell folks all. So I grew up 20 minutes from San Francisco, 20, 30 minutes I on the no East idea. Bay. So uh, so I, I will take that as a, as a great compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I don't live there anymore. Uh, but for those listening, uh, you know, the Northern California shore, it's just mm -hmm. beautiful. It's not just sunny Southern California. It's not. Take a few minutes and go up north. So I think that's awesome. Uh, what's a TV show, book, movie, or podcast you'd recommend? Mm -hmm. You don't have to recommend this one. You need another <laughs> one. That goes without saying. Right. So I'll save that one. Right. Um, one of the best series I saw not that long ago was HBO's Chernobyl. Oh, okay. taking us through the disaster mm -hmm. and I, I mean from what i've read it was like so hauntingly accurate wow um yeah i i mean i i love you know understanding mm -hmm. uh, you know exactly what what went on and how they tried to address it and yeah absolutely crazy to think of the scenario back then i can only imagine well i do remember the time frame but uh <laughs> in any case <laughs> but that's the inquisitive scientists mm -hmm. in you wanting to get behind the story. Uh, so I got to ask you, if you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? I would probably be a professor because okay. I love teaching. Okay. Obviously love that research aspect. Uh, in another world where the sight of blood didn't make me <laughs> queasy, I'd probably be a veterinarian, but I'm really? pretty sure passing out <laughs> your patients <laughs> wouldn't work out so well. Uh, well, that's awesome. Uh, both of them extremely commendable. So, uh, but I got to tell you where you're at right now is it more commendable from my part. But uh, I'm a little biased. So, uh, and this is the tough one. This one gets everybody. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Man, I think back to my childhood and conversations I still have with my brothers on this, and it's got to be teleportation. <laughs> my 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 brother is my older brother is a philosophy professor, and he still jokes to me like, Where, "You got the teleportation device ready yet or not?" So Where are we going next week? I'm just week? gonna have to yeah, be like, "Nope, God is a superpower." Sorry. <laughs> Well, listen, that's outstanding. I, I just want to say again, it's been uh, very enlightening. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to share your story with us. I hope folks get a better understanding uh, of what the AMOC is, perhaps isn't, uh, and all the exciting things that are down the road from us. So with that said, uh, Dr. Holsworth, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes, leave us a review, subscribe, tell your friends about us. Till next time, Manny Pacheco signing off.